Hi everyone, my name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and this is your weekly space hangout for Friday, September 20th, 2013. This week, we've got stories about the Antares launch and Rocket Armadillo, the end of Deep Impact, uh, the lack of Mythian on Mars, the zodiacal light, uh, the Black Hole Universe, an interview with Chris Cassidy, the Ghost Sea re-entry, Luca Parmitano, Rubber Room under the launch pad, and an update on Comet Ice. We've got a ton of stories, and we have gathered together the finest space journalists that we've been able to find. So, and <laughs> let me just introduce everyone that we've got here. So first, in no particular order, well, alphabetical order, from left to right in what I see, we've got Amy Shira Title. Amy. Hello. Uh, that's weird, it didn't go to you. Try again. Introduce yourself. Say hi again, Amy. Hello. Hello. Do All you right. Have to talk more for it to work. <laughs> yes. All more right. forcefully with a yeah. Um, we got David Dickinson. Hey. hey. Still thinks digital watches are a neat idea. Yep. We've got a new person joining us this week, and that's Elizabeth Howell. Hey, Elizabeth. Hi. Nice to meet everybody. Uh, so if people. Fan. <laughs> aren't aware. Elizabeth is a, a freelancer that's done some work for Universe Today, but you also write uh, in all kinds of places. You write everywhere, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Trying to keep busy, I guess. Yes, I write for Space.com, Space Exploration Network, uh, a few magazines such as All About Space, and uh, basically whoever wants to give me a call and say, hey, write something. Like uh, Canadian Geographic actually just published something as well, so I'm really Perfect. enjoying it. Thank you. And and now you've got your uh, you got your Twitter handle right down there. So if anyone does need to give you a call, there's the way to do it. Uh, and last but not least, we've got Jason Major. Hey, space fans. <laughs> All right. So let's just start with the sort of big <clears throat> traditional news that a rocket launched. Uh, and Elizabeth, did you cover you covered the Antares launch? I did cover the Antares launch, and it was quite the milestone for orbital sciences because it's only the second company, the second private company in the United States to send anything over to the International Space Station like this. So what's going on is the NASA has an agreement with several companies where they're trying to get them to send cargo and also crew, which is another matter, up to the space station eventually. And what they do first is a series of tests just to make sure that everything is working okay and then if it does then they get a supply agreement to send so many spacecraft up there to the station and that's what's been happening here. What happened was uh, Orbital sent up a rocket, an Antares rocket, on board was a Cygnus spacecraft. Everything is working pretty well so far. Cygnus is on its way to the space station and should dock there if all goes to plan around Sunday. And then if everything happens as everybody expects it to, then what will happen is Cygnus will have another eight visits to the International Space Station in the next little while. And it's, I think it's about a $1.9 billion contract in the U.S. dollars. So pretty exciting. And hopefully they're going to be doing just as successfully as SpaceX did. That's the other company that everybody has heard about that's been setting stuff up there. SpaceX has made, I believe, two flights up to the station to date and has several others coming up. Whoa. I, I don't know what else to say. Um, I, I mean, have we solved this problem? I know that you know for a while there, the space station was really reliant on the Russians for the Soyuz uh, spacecraft to get the astronauts up there, and as well as the progress for the cargo. Have they now sort of solved the the, the homegrown solution for the cargo? For the cargo, it looks like we're well on our way, but we can't say for sure, of course, until Cygnus actually gets to the station and docks, and they have to go through a review afterwards. But it looks like on a tentative basis, they are coming to a conclusion on that side. And then, of course, the next big piece is going to be the crew. And that's a complicated issue on, on its own, because for one thing, there's some questions about whether the budget is going to be available for that. But NASA's going through its fiscal 2014 negotiations right now, and nobody really knows how much money is going to be available for the commercial program. In fact, the three companies that are right now competing for that, some legislation agents are saying maybe we should try and cut that down to two or one that NASA is funding to send up there. And uh, there's a lot of debate right now. We don't know how that's going to play out. And there's a lot of threats also on NASA's side that if there's any less money coming to the program in the next little while, they're going to have to either drop some companies or delay the crew launches from American soil. And I know that's been really the big push lately because after all it's been a couple of years since the shuttle finished, we don't really know uh, how long it's going to be until Americans can launch again from uh, the Kennedy Space Center or any other spaceports in the United States soil. And it's difficult because what if, for whatever reason, the launches in Kazakhstan don't work out anymore? Where are we going to go next? So there really is a, an independence problem and there's also just a American pride problem because, after all, there's been a space program there for decades and why can't we get their own people off the ground? Yeah. Um, and now... I think, Cygnus, and, I, think oh, ahead, is, I think Cygnus is docking tomorrow, too. I believe it is tomorrow. It's 20... 
22nd, I think. So maybe 22nd? Sunday. 22nd? That's Sunday. Yeah. yeah, I think it is Sunday that they're going to dock. They're going to they're gonna attempt docking if everything goes well. Any observation plans, David? Unfortunately, not here. I checked all the passes. I think there are passes further up uh, along northern U.S. and Canada. I saw a post briefly about citing it, so it will be approaching, but there's no, no passes here from Florida, so... But it would be kind of cool to see. I have seen the shuttle approach back in the shuttle era. Uh, I've made video of that. That's kind of neat to see. And I've seen Dragon on approach, too, on the last mission. You could see Dragon approaching it. Now, now, last week we talked about, we talked about the frog that uh, joined the Laddie launch. And, uh, and this week we've got another animal that attempted to uh, get involved in in a launch, and I'm going to try and pull up this video. I don't know if this is going to work. It's like Animal uh, Farm. The animals it, are taking over. <laughs> it, it, seems like, it seems like every launch these days has some kind of an animal mascot or totem yeah. that goes along with it, you know, yeah. just to kind of, you know, like you have to sacrifice some sort well, of local well, creature. Well, that's it. In animal order for the sacrifice, yeah. <laughs> I think now we're looking for it. Now that now it's almost a standard thing every launch we're looking for uh, wildlife. Yeah, do you remember here. at what point it happens? It was oh boy, okay. So there Is that it goes. It right there? It's, no. It's just after this. Oh, it it just okay. It's really tough to tell. Was that it, it there? It runs from it runs from uh, left to right on the left hand left middle part of the screen and basically and this was captured on a on GoPro Hero camera by uh, Matthew Travis, uh, who had a camera set up uh, on site, and he says it's an armadillo running across the field, actually into the launch plume. Um, Ouch! Now you know I don't know if I don't know if it is an armadillo. Someone else, uh, uh, Ben Cooper uh, from uh, Launch Photography. There, he, there. Um, you see it? You see it? It's right there. Right there. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. I mean, they're it's, pretty. It's, it's, it's hightailing it across the field, and um, uh, and Ben Cooper suggested it might actually be a hog, which you know both armadillos and wild hogs are you know pretty uh, uh, ubiquitous in uh, <laughs> you know the Cape Canaveral Thank Space you. Coast area. So to find either one would not be uh, surprising. But I, yeah, I, wonder, I mean, I wonder how long it will be before people will start photoshopping animals into launches that we'll have to like start debunking that too. <laughs> Well, and I, you know, we, when we made a lot of fun of the frog one, I, we got a few people who, who were, you know, some animal rights issues, and you can see how I think it's, it's important to understand that there is an impact on the environment, that when these rockets launch, they are not launching in a complete vacuum, as it were. They are, they are blasting off in the middle of an ecosystem, and many animals are sacrificing their lives for space exploration. Including <laughs> sometimes humans. So well, yeah, I mean, you know, you go to um, when you go to uh, uh, Cape Canaveral, you go to Kennedy Space Station, and you're going to see, you know, ba I mean, this really is an ecosystem there. <laughs> I mean, between the turkey vultures that are flying overhead, uh, there are five foot, six foot, seven foot gators in all of the uh, ponds and re you know retaining ponds and uh, uh, drainage ditches. Um, there's manatees in the turn basin there. I mean, I mean, you know, if there weren't launching rockets, it would actually be otherwise a very interesting place to go and just you know watch watch the wildlife. Um, so you know you've got these these things taking it's off all, right in the middle of all this. It's all protected in there too, not only from right. development but from hunting and everything else, mm -hmm. and from like boaters and all the other stuff that would drive animals away. So I've I've they, almost they actually got I've a pretty good life there. I've almost hit uh, a family of, of wild pigs crossing the road one <laughs> early one morning when I was going to a launch. So you know you really have to watch out when you're driving around over there because it is it is there, it, you know first and foremost it's their territory. So it's a difficult interaction between the people as well as the animals because when I was taking a tour of the Kennedy Space Center a few years ago, they were pointing out the fences and the fences are quite tall, probably uh, six or seven feet tall, and they also curve around the top. And that way, the alligators, or sorry, the gators can't get up the sides and around and over the top, down back into the compound. And I also have heard reports of snakes and other things being found inside of there. You know, despite their best efforts, so it really is on the edge of a wildlife refuge, and it creates some interesting situations for sure. It's a beautiful place. If if uh, if you've never been out there and actually had a chance to explore the whole like park, like wildlife reserve around the Cape Canaveral, it's quite amazing. The whole Merritt, the Merritt Island. Uh, yeah, 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 it's just beautiful. You just head north and you can kind of yeah, you can check out. There's like uh, you know bird watching, all kinds of great stuff. It's a really neat place. It's, uh, so, I, yeah, between the between the the frog that was caught on camera <laughs> over uh, on Wallops Island, 
um, to you know this armadillo slash wild pig, whatever it happens to be, running across the launch field. Um, there was also at, later on that day at the um, at the Antares launch, there was an eagle that was spotted, uh, you know, that had gotten spooked off of one of the lightning towers uh, that was surrounding the pad. Um, you know, I mean, there's just there's just stuff. The, the, of course, then they had the space bat that was, you know, uh, that had kind of attached to the uh, external fuel tank uh, a few years back. So, you know, Spe- speaking critters. speaking of animals, I don't know if you've heard. It just came to mind a few days ago. A news article came around that Iran, their space agency, wants to launch a cat. <laughs> Yeah, they want to put a Persian cat up there. Yeah, it's and I thought that might be from the Onion at first, so I had to search around to make sure that I wasn't being had by that article. But no, that that does appear to be an actual plan of theirs. <laughs> uh, you know, right. and we and we say and we say, hey, you know. Uh, they want to put a Persian cat up into orbit. How goofy is that? But then you think about all the animals that that you know the U.S. put into orbit, uh, I, and 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 you know and the Soviet I, Union put into orbit before they put people up there. So I don't, I mean, I don't think kind a, of the growing pains. I guess I don't think a cat has been done. I was talking to my wife. And it's like you know they've done dogs and snakes and monkeys and everything else. I don't think they've ever launched a cat. <laughs> I've any, seen a cat in the, in the vomit comet, and they, they don't like zero gravity, so it'll be interesting to <laughs> yeah, see what one that does. Makes no They're sense, constantly but... trying to flip around and find the ground. And just you can't train a cat. You tell them, push the button, and they look at you. I'm not pushing the button. You know? <laughs> Excuse so. me? You push the button. <laughs> <laughs> Where's my food? Uh, okay, so let's move on to, uh, to the end of Deep Impact. Yeah, um, you know, unfortunately... Uh, things didn't work out exactly as planned, and Deep Impact will not be capturing pictures of Comet Ison as it zooms past uh, this November. Um, they they lost they lost signal with with the spacecraft, uh, and in doing so, aren't able to realign it. So it may actually just be spinning out of control, as as it was put in the Nature.com article. Um, you know, Deep Impact launched uh, back in 2005. It's, I mean, it's it's just taken this, you know, a grand tour of its own uh, of the inner solar system. You know, go. It's visited. It's visited two comets. It it smashed a, a probe into one of them to see what would happen. Um, it found the first evidence of water ice on a comet, uh, and it's also imaged ice in already uh, from a considerable distance. And it also took some of the first measurements of uh, comet Garad. So it's done a lot of work since the end of its primary, you know, deep impact mission, where it um, where it put an impactor onto, and I believe it was uh, Comet Temple One uh, in July of 2005. So I mean, all this time it's been, you know, zooming around the solar system, doing other things, uh, spotting under other comets, and uh, they were kind of hoping that it would take some great pictures of Ison as it comes past, and unfortunately that just wasn't in the cards. And uh, today, NASA officially announced the end of the Deep Impact mission. It's a conspiracy. They don't totally. want us to see you know, it. You know that I'm that... I'm already yeah, getting I mean, it's, it's All it's doing is sending signals to the uh, alien spacecraft that are following closely yeah. behind ISON. And, um, you know, it's I don't a Klingon know. bird of prey that actually is. <laughs> it's, you know. it's cloaked, and that's why they can't yeah. communicate with it. <laughs> well, why don't, we, uh, why don't we switch? I was going to put this later on in the, in the lineup, but why don't we switch right to that, David, because... Uh, you know, conspiracy theories abound. So let's talk a bit about that. You you did a terrific article in Universe Today just yeah, to, just a couple of days I, ago about uh, Ison and the Pope and it, and all these predictions. Every, every time I start searching around, I keep finding up more uh, conspiracy theories that I had never actually heard of before. So I was doing an article. This came up when I started researching a bit about uh, the idea that a Pope had excommunicated Halley's Comet uh, right after the the Constantinople had fallen in the 1450s. Do comets uh, it, go to heaven? Uh, well, apparently the story is kind of apocryphal because there's no real primary sources for it. It seems like it's kind of an embellishment that was added on to a papal bull from Pope Calixtus III. Now, there's no actual primary record saying this, but it's something. It's one of those stories that's almost it's so good that it keeps coming around every time a comet comes around and people want to compile their fun facts about comets. You see this, uh, once a pope excommunicated a comet. I couldn't find any primary sources on it, but it's one of those stories, it's almost as interesting to see how the misinformation had evolved when it came around. But as I was researching this and I started typing in pope and comet and things like that, 
uh, all the stuff about Eisen and Nostradamus came up, so I realized there was a little something I could tie in that there's currently an idea up, out there that Nostradamus had written a quatrain, which actually reads, uh, The great star for seven days shall burn, so nakedly clear like two suns appearing, the large dog all night howling, whatever that means, while the great pontiff shall depart, shall change his territory. And there's some sites that think that it's because the last pope had retired and stepped down, that it's, as Eisen is coming in, that there's some kind of connection to it. There's some kind of connection with Eisen and Pope Francis. You know, comets come around every year. The same with eclipses when you try to predict anything with eclipses or earthquakes or, you know, you can find and retrofit anything in there to say, like, this eclipse or earthquake happened during this event. So it's uh, it's not really that compelling. Plus, when you look at, when you read the quatrains, they're translated from medieval French into English. So you can you can really kind of interpret them any way you want. But I just David, will will uh, will Eisen be traveling through uh, the, the Canis Major because there's your no. great dog right there. Oh, okay. I, I Never thought mind. that. I forget about it. <laughs> no, it's it's uh, it's actually coming in right now. It's in Cancer. It's going to be crossing over into the constellation Leo. It's following the zodiac right now, basically. It's going to be going in through Leo, Virgo. Libra, then it's going to be swinging around the sun in November, and then going out. Uh, it's going to actually be heading towards circumpolar in January, February. After it swings around, it's going to actually pass very close to the pole of the Earth. So it's, uh, but you know, like I said, you you can retrofit these kind of predictions to anything you want. But it's it's uh, it's it's kind of a new twist on you know. It's like okay, they're getting a little more original. It's not the Nibiru meets Hailbop kind of. Uh, they're trying to mix, mix mash it up a little bit now. So. So with uh, the end of Deep Impact, um, sorry, I interrupted you, Fraser. Is no, that okay? Go ahead. All right, go ahead. Um, with the end of Deep Impact, David, how are we going to be able to keep an eye on ISON in the near future? Amateurs are already watching it. Amateurs are already imaging it now. And Hubble will start imaging it when it comes around. Uh, I've seen some amateur. It's like 12th magnitude right now, so it's very faint. I, you know, I was thinking, I, I haven't actually seen it for myself yet. So it probably Pretty much all the major missions are, are going to be um, that are out there, if they can, will be turning at some point to look at Ison as it, as it comes by. Even, even messenger around Mercury is going be, um, is well, going be sw you know, swinging out yeah. to look at, um, to look at Ison. It, it's passing Mars here in about a week or so too. So uh, MSL and I don't know if high rise is going to be tasked to look at it, but I've heard ideas for MSL, although it's not designed to observe the sky we may get our first image of a comet from the surface of another planet. That will be kind of cool. So, Will Orbiter be looking at it, ESA, uh, ESAs? I don't know if those are tasked or not. I would think high rise unless there's something technical I don't know, because high rise has got an awesome camera on it, I sure. would think. Would be, uh, would be a, it's got almost like the equivalent of Hubble on, on it, only it's looking at Mars. But unless there's something technical, I don't know about tasking it. I know when I went to the MAVEN conference, we asked them about Comet A1 sighting springs that's coming by. Uh, and they may try to observe that. Okay. It looks, it looks like Fraser's found the cat in space. The cat space in video. Microgravity, uh, video. This comes from uh, Yov Landsman on the uh, on the comments. This is awesome. Yeah. Cats so in space we, are we, we love well, cats. Have you have you written about this, Amy? Because this is awesome. I'm gonna run this a little more here. No, I haven't. I've never seen it. I have that. posted it just because that's. That's that's not. a test. That's a test on one of the uh, on one of the uh, um, uh, what, what's the term there on one of the parabolic flights. Vomit comet. Oh, the vomit uh, comet, KC135. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I don't know if it's specifically that plane or not because it looks like a pretty old uh, old video. But yeah, they they wanted to see what would happen if they released some cats, uh, you know, during during the moment of microgravity. <laughs> and that's the result. That. And that is the result. And that's why we don't send cats to space, because they freak out. <laughs> they freak out. They were not pleased, <laughs> unlike the calm dogs um, and, uh, and spacefaring monkeys. Okay. Uh, so, so, sorry, David. I just... That's okay. I, no, that's kind of cool. Yeah, I've never yeah. seen that before. Um, well, I'm writing up a big post for ice in uh, my first observing post. Bob King's done one, too. But yeah. it should be reaching... Telescope, uh, like backyard binocular telescope magnitude here, mid October maybe. So I, I'm going to be writing up my big post coming early next week on uh, basically tenth magnitude perihelion. Now, nice Dave, one. if I can just if I could just hij hijack this to ask you a question here. No. Um, re just I mean, an hour or so ago, there was an article in New Scientist, uh, basically claiming right off the bat that Ison's going to be a dud and it's going to fizzle. Um, now. You know, I think this, you're going to see more of those, but I don't buy it. 
Okay. All right. So, so that's not really the general consensus. It is. It it is about a magnitude fainter than the light curves predicted right now. But I I still think the best show is going to be after Perihelion if it survives Perihelion. I, I don't think it's going to be a really spectacular comet uh, through October. It's going to be a decent one for backyard imagers and people that are equipped to chase after. It might reach naked eye magnitude maybe in November, and then when it goes toward perihelion, once it swings around and it unfurls its tail, I think we're going to have a good comet around Christmas time, the weeks leading up to Christmas. Or if it dissolves, it's only passing, what, like within a million miles of the sun? So if it, if it breaks apart into nothing, then it will be like Comet Ellen in a few years ago where we expected a great comet and it just blew, broke apart. Then we'll have the conspiracy theories that Bruce Willis went up there and destroyed it. So. <laughs> could it break up into a string of comets like what happened with Shoemaker yeah. Levy 9? Oh, yeah, it definitely could. We've had comets do that before. So it's, com comets are uh, they're one of those things that it's great how they're, they're unpredictable in that sense. The that, wild you know, card. A lot, a lot of things, but that makes it interesting to report about. So. Well, Comet Ice and Watch 2013 continues. We'll keep on reporting every week and keep you up to date, everyone. Um, all right, well, let's move on then. Uh, so we're going to talk about the methane on Mars, or lack thereof, Elizabeth. I think you're muted. Can we... I think you're muted, Elizabeth. Her. My apologies, everybody. I'm back now. Uh, what I was saying was that this debate has been going on for decades, and nobody really has a definitive answer yet. But for what it's worth, uh, methane is seen as a symbol of life because certain microbes do emit it. There are other microbes that emit other things, but methane is considered to be a pretty definitive idea that there is life somewhere on the surface. So people have been getting excited over the years when methane was found in various measured quantities, just depending on what you were doing by various missions. So the first one went back to about 1999, and then we've had various other measurements from ground-based observatories as well as uh, observatories in orbit around Mars. And then NASA said, well, okay, great, we're going to send down this rover that we have, the Mars Curiosity rover, onto the surface. We're going to equip it with a very sensitive spectrometer, and we're going to look for methane right at the landing site at Gale Crater. And they did that, and they found nothing. And then they tried it again, and they found nothing. And overall, they have tried six times between October 2012 and June 2013. They don't see a thing. Um, they are estimating that the methane on Mars that has been found must be at least 1.3 parts per billion at the most, which is only one-sixth as much as earlier estimates. Now, here's where things start to get a little bit more interesting, because readers of Universe Today would probably remember that back in about 2009, there was an Earth-bound observation of Mars, and it was saying that there was a heck of a lot of methane over on the, uh, the surface. And NASA was saying, well, you know, the highest concentrations of methane have actually come from the Earth-based observatories. Now, they didn't elaborate in the press release, but it sounds like they're implying that they think peering through the Earth's atmosphere may have distorted the measurements. So it's interesting because on the one hand we've got this rover on the surface that can't really find very much methane at all. On the other hand we have these other observations that have a lot of methane in some cases and some areas. So I don't think the end of it is here. You know, we, we haven't been able to find methane in this case, but I think that it's still going to be something that's talked about because there are all these other measurements. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's two ways really to look for life here on Mars. The one option is you send the rover and you dig in the ground and you take the soil and you mix it around with some nutrients and hopefully some gases are going to come out that are evident that there's some kind of life process that's going on. But this other way is that you, if you could just look at the planet and just see the gases in the atmosphere from afar, then you would know that there was life there that was continuing to keep these these volatile gases that would normally just break up under sunlight within a couple of hundred years. So so this was like the short the shortcut to say, oh, there's the life on Mars. And the fact that they were seeing this from Earth was really exciting, but now they had, curiosity hasn't been able to to duplicate it. So I mean, do you like what do you think right now from from where they're going? Do you think that that this is like the nail in the coffin, or is it, you know, is it the atmosphere from Earth that they're looking through? I mean, where do you think they're going to go now? I think what we need is more observations from more locations, and I realize that's a terrible thing to say because there aren't that many Mars rovers heading over in that direction. But this is the thing about how um, how any kind of Earth observation works. You've got stuff from above, satellites, and then you have down on the ground, which is ground truth. And people realize they need to have both in order to get an accurate perspective on what's going on. And so if you have somebody in one location on a planet taking a measurement, it's pretty hard to say that's a definitive thing around the entire planet. So I think that, you know, at best, the best thing would be to have some kind of a probe that would send six or seven of 
these detectors down onto the surface, take some measurements and find out what's going on because it could depend on the terrain, it could depend on the weather, it could depend on a lot of other things, you know, depending on what's coming into the atmosphere, what's coming out. Now, uh, NASA was able to make some more general comments about what's going on. They were saying that probably from the measurements they have at this one location, only 10 to 20 tons per year of methane enter the atmosphere of Mars. And to compare that to Earth, that's 50 million times less. So it seems that whatever's happening there is a very mm -hmm. slow process. And in fact, they did make some points about how persistent methane is in the atmosphere. It would last for hundreds of years. And there's no way that it could be measured as being in great quantities on the one hand, and then on the other hand, having a measurement down on the ground showing that there's a small quantity. So something is a bit off. And that's the great thing about science. You just never have a definitive answer in some cases about what's going on. You need to have multiple measurements. And that's why I think that, no, this isn't the nail in the coffin. It's going to go on for quite a while. All right. Well, then let's uh, let's hope it continues in, on. Um, in India's Mars orbiter going up in a few weeks has got a methane detector on it too. I was doing an article about that last week. So yeah, that's right. right. That's the the you know have an orbiter that's going to be able to to do. Maven Maven doesn't per se. We asked that at the conference too. It's not targeting methane specifically, but it's going to be analyzing the atmosphere. But the, the Indian India's orbiter is going to. That's awesome. And I say the more observations, the better. You know, if we can get the Europeans looking at it, the Indians looking at it, everybody just trying to figure out what's going on here. Because that's another great thing about science. It's truly international. People can work together, try different spacecraft, try different approaches. And that way we can get a bit more of a consensus about what's happening here. All right, well, let's move on. So, so Amy, uh, I know this was the big story that you worked on this week, and I know Elizabeth worked on it too. Uh, the, the two hardest working people in all of space journalism. This is what... <laughs> This is as we say. Uh, so, Amy, uh, is it possible that our entire universe is located inside a black hole? Um, well, let's not say possible. Let's say that there is a theory out there that is saying that instead of being rooted in a Big Bang, that sort of the theory that we're all used to, it's part of a black hole. So I feel like I should preface this by reminding everyone that I am not a physicist. <laughs> um, so I, if we have, have no PhD. Yeah, we have no PhD <laughs> astrophysicists here today. Normally, we have one or two PhD astrophysicist ringers that we can run all so, the stuff past. So How many expect... viewers dropped off when you said we have no PhD? I know, I know. <laughs> they really expect Sorry. that from us. So, so we are going to just remind you that. Uh, I, but, we we have our degrees in other places. So. But we're allowed to speculate, so that's even better. Yes, and I, I am allowed to just tell you what the what the story is, so we're just going to do that. <laughs> We've been um, trained well by our <laughs> physicist friends. There you go. Um, so, so the sort of the Big Bang that we all know and know and love, I guess, is that the universe started at some singular point, um, and out of that point burst forth everything possible. And... That, that theory does some good stuff in that it explains why we observe that the universe is actually expanding, but it doesn't explain everything because physics can't actually explain how everything got into that point of singularity and what that is and what where that was, and it's, it just, it all becomes a mess. I don't remember much from doing proper science, but I do remember that there's just a breakdown of everything that, like, Newton and everyone just, like, you can't, you can't make it work, so it just doesn't work. So various physicists who understand this stuff properly um, have been looking at alternative theories to the Big Bang to explain where the universe has come from. Um, and and one, one group of physicists had looked at this idea that um, that space is actually a, or that, that there's this sort of bulk universe, that, that the three-dimensional universe that we are in is actually a membrane that floats through what they call a bulk universe made of four spatial dimensions. And this is where my head starts to hurt. Um, so another group of physicists took this idea of the bulk universe and our three-dimensional universe being a membrane in there. Um, <laughs> sorry, I got distracted. Jason just called it the Costco universe. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so a bunch of physicists took this idea Big. of the bulk universe and our, our universe being a membrane and sort of said that if there is a four-dimensional universe that there would th could theoretically be four-dimensional stars and those four-dimensional stars could collapse on themselves to form four-dimensional black holes. So, so this, is, this is where it kind of gets interesting. So in our universe when a black hole collapses or when a star collapses it creates a black hole and around that black hole is the event horizon is bounded on all sides, and that boundary is where light and nothing can escape. Um, and that boundary is a two-dimensional surface in three-dimensional space. But in a four-dimensional space, that boundary would be a three-dimensional form called a hypersphere. Um, so, so the idea is that if there, 
if all of space uh, is a four-dimensional bulk universe, and there was a four-dimensional star that collapsed on itself, created a four-dimensional um, black hole, and spewed out material in the form of a three-dimensional membrane, that is our universe. <laughs> um, so get your heads around that. <laughs> so the idea is that this, this theory is kind of interesting because it explains um, some things that the Big Bang Theory can't. So, uh, one, of, one of those being that our universe has a pretty even temperature throughout. Um, in this four-dimensional black hole, matter would have had a, theoretically an eternity and just infinite time to become uniform so that when the three-dimensional material is ejected it would be the uniform that we see. However, the uh, cosmic radiation microwave background that we see as evidence of the Big Bang Theory does not support this kind of black hole model. Um, so it's it's all messy and there's all kinds of intricacies that I'm not even going to try to talk about. Um, but it's also, I mean, we're not, we're not going to rewrite textbooks just yet because there are a lot of different models to the Big Bang Theory. I'm not sure how that would be testable. That's what, there's a lot of those. <laughs> oh, that was great, Amy. Nicely <laughs> done. I think it's, that was great. Have to report on that. I think it's yeah. I think it's really important to to note that this is this is on um, Astro PH. This is on the pre press. Uh, listing on Astro PH on archive, and so these are the these are the you know for those of us who are e as space journalists, uh, we'll often go and look at this, and they're sort of lists of of journals that have been submitted, but not necessarily uh, peer reviewed and and published in in significant journals yet. Now on the on the one hand, it's great because we get access to this stuff early. On the other hand, it's bad because this stuff hasn't been fully peer reviewed, and so. Um, but I mean, like with Astronomy Cast, we get this question all the time: What, you know, are we living inside a black hole in the future when all of the matter gets pulled back together? And you know, will, will it turn into a black hole? And then will we be living inside a black hole? Are we living inside a black hole right now? And I think that for a lot of people, that that idea that the universe started as a singularity and then maybe could return to a black hole is very compelling and intriguing. But but um, but I, this is so far away from <laughs> from uh, you know a theory with any kind of evidence that it's you know just, I think just, we need to do our job and make sure that we really get across that this is purely preliminary, just yeah. math. Th this yeah, really let's, grew let's legs say though. That it's a model and it's an idea. It's nothing that we should start quoting. Is the thing because the, the, it still remains that the theory, even though we can't totally explain the Big Bang theory, it's the one that we have the most evidence of, and it's really hard to disprove the cosmic microwave background the, radiation yeah, that the, you see. The, the, there is the Big a, Bang that's, is that's testable. A yeah. There's a great resource uh, that I've been linking to every time he posts a new video, and this is Zog from Betelgeuse, and he has been posting these wonderful videos about the sort of the the geometry of the universe and how how we can have a universe that has no edge and how you could travel in one direction and return to your starting point and they're mm -hmm. just terrific so do yeah. do a search for this for Zog from Betelgeuse Zog the alien uh, and he's done two of them so far and he's got a third one coming the first one just explains this idea of a flat uh, four-dimensional space that we could be moving through and uh, and they're just great so now Elizabeth you worked on the story too so was there anything in it you might want to add to it I was thinking that it'd be interesting if we could try and get Planck to take some more measurements because one of the big problems with this theory is that Planck's measurements of the cosmic microwave background did not jive with what was going on in the theory. Now as for the theory, the astronomers were saying, well, we're going to go back and rework the theory and try and make it fit the observations, but I think even a fresh set of observations would be great, if not from Planck, then from another satellite, just to get some more insight into this. Well, we did a, a note earlier on this year, and I, I'm not sure which episode it was, but uh, there's some holes are starting to get poked into the concept of inflation. That Planck, some Planck's readings have uh, have not matched some of the predictions made with the inflationary theory of the universe. And this is this idea that within the first few seconds of the universe, it went through this massive rate of inflation and expansion you know, expanding light years in distance just in a very short period of time and the new observations from Planck aren't aren't holding that up. So, so I, you know, we can just add this to the pile of concepts all flowing around. But and one uh, of the, uh, I remember one of the first um, big, you know, one of the first big media articles that came out um, 
had an interview uh, briefly with one of the uh, one of the, the researchers uh, of this theory, and they mentioned something how basically they 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 took the standing issue of the Big Bang and they said we rewrote it or we rewrote the history of the universe in which the Big Bang just kind of didn't happen that way. So, I mean, that's kind of a bold statement to make, yeah, it is. Um, especially in the world of astrophysics where that can get you, you know, that can get your head bitten off real quick. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what the rebuttal is from, you know, people who are actually researchers in the field, uh, you know, in response to this, which was kind of like, it grew, like I said it before, it grew legs really quickly, um, getting picked up off of the uh, off of the uh, the archive and um, you know and and the the, pr the pre press so. and yeah and a anyone here who's gotten stung by reporting on something on archive put up your hand <laughs> yeah well, so we'll so we're it. all yeah we're all a little a little I am now no longer allergic to uh, to stings <laughs> and slings and arrows yeah. <laughs> no but I mean we I are guess my time's coming then I have oh I can't really think okay well, I can't think report. of anything. I've really run with that's been turned out to be totally bogus. But that's because yeah. Dave's never I've wrong. Had, no, yeah. I've, I've had no, I've had to edit no. some things. There's there's been a lot of things that have been caught that that are, uh, but yeah, yeah. Because this theory has a lot of questions associated with it. There's also the the matter of dark energy, dark matter, how it might be accelerating the expansion of the universe. I mean, is this accounted for in the theory? I couldn't really tell. Maybe it was somewhere in the paper, but there's just a whole lot of other implications. You know, if we if we agree that this is true, okay. Then what about all this other stuff that we've been talking about over the years? All these other theories about how the universe is expanding and growing and changing. So, this is this is hurting my mind, but it's pretty interesting. <laughs> That's why I like this type of stuff. <laughs> yeah, this stuff's fascinating, but it's really important. To, like when you compare this kind of a theory with the mountains of evidence of the Big Bang. I mean, you've got you've got the cosmic microwave background radiation. You've got the fact that the galaxies are speeding away from us. You've got the the ratios of hydrogen and helium in the universe and the amount of lithium. Uh, there the age is of the just, white dwarfs. The age of the white dwarfs. There's just this beautiful collection of evidence that all points back to the Big Bang. And anything that comes along now needs to explain all of those things and then explain the things that are still mysteries with the Big Bang. And, and we are so far away from that that it's not even funny. So um, let's move on. Uh, please, <laughs> astrophysics, I hope that did this justice. Don't send me the letters. Um, send them. Just a fun idea. It's just a fun, a fun idea. idea. <laughs> it's hilarious. So people just turn this all the way down. I we admit it. This crazy idea, and that's all. Um, this is okay. how science journalists have fun: is we go for beers and we talk for this type of stuff. So. Yeah. Uh, no, we love this stuff. We love it. Uh, okay, uh, David, let's talk about the the zodiacal light. Yeah, it's uh, uh, there were some photos went around from uh, astrophotographer Corey Schmidt he took out in the desert, Nevada desert, last weekend. And it's something I'd wanted to write about anyway, and I'm like, hey, now I have uh, some pretty cool intro photos to I'll use. I'll dig up some photos yeah. here for you. Right, right, around, right around, we're approaching the equinox, the September equinox, the beginning of fall for the Northern Hemisphere and spring for the Southern Hemisphere, unless somebody from the Southern Hemisphere correct me. And right around this time in the morning for the Northern Hemisphere and for and in the dusk for the Southern Hemisphere is a good time to see what's known as the zodiacal light. And what you're seeing, actually, is it's named the zodiacal light because it follows the ecliptic and the constellations of the zodiac. And you're seeing dust particles out in the solar system that are reflecting back sunlight. That are, it's, just, it's a very tenuous thing to see. I've never seen it here from Florida. I've seen it from Maine, and I've seen it from Arizona, where the skies are a little darker. Yeah, there's Corey's photo. And you yeah. can also see Jupiter in there up in Taurus, that bright object uh, just off to the my right, probably your left of center, and Mars and the Beehive are actually down there too, a little lower. Comet Ison would be in there somewhere, but we can't see it. It's too faint. But it is in, in that frame, uh, not too far off from Mars. Yeah, you're seeing that very tenuous glow going up from the horizon there. And he had another cool one that I thought was cool, where he actually showed it kind of crossing with the galactic plane. And I'm like, that's neat, because you can see the actual trace of the ecliptic and the trace of the galactic plane and you can kind of get a good visual yeah. of how different they are right. in let that. Me, uh, let me get this one up for you too. Uh, the, yeah, so Corey, Corey Schwitz is great. Corey is a, is a good friend of, uh, of everything we do. He's a participant in the uh, Virtual Star Party and just a great guy. All right, let the, me... Uh, the, the, the zodiacal light is also a good gauge of how dark your skies are. If you can see it, you're probably in under what they call Bortle Scale 5. 
Bortle Scale 4, Bortle Scale 5, which is, yeah, that one there you can see the cross. The galactic plane is coming up from one side of the image in the zodiacal light, which traces out the, the plane of the ecliptic. And you can see Jupiter right there again. And I see the Taurus, Hyades, and the Pleiades in the constellation Orion, too. Now, now our solar systems tip to what, like a 63-degree 60, angle or something like that? To the... Just to, to the plane of the galaxy, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we're... Yeah, and you you can actually see right about where the sun is going to be, where the sun was during the summertime, where it crossed over there, and it's oh. going to be along the plane of the galaxy again come hey, December yeah. or so. But, yeah, that's amazing. Like that is, uh, yeah. yeah. What a what a picture. Yeah, so it, it, you need pretty dark skies to see it. And again, that's probably why I've never seen it here from Florida, but I have seen it from Arizona. Another phenomenon related is called the Gegenschein, that is actually at the anti-solar point. And I checked the pronunciation of that. Two or three sites agree that the German pronunciation is the Gegenschein. So before people tell me I'm pronouncing it wrong, that that is the it, it's it's a counterglow that sits at the anti-solar point that is caused by the same phenomenon where there's dust particles that are at 100% illumination looking back. I've never seen this. You need really dark skies to catch so, this. So it's basically like a like a sun glory of it, it kind of is in space. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like you would see if you were like in, a, in an airplane with the sun on one side of yeah. you and the clouds on the like, other. Like, or... a, like a, a mock, like, yeah, uh, at the anti-solar point. Uh, it's interesting, Al Worden in, on the Apollo 15 mission, they actually tried to photograph this from the moon when he was, because he was a command module pilot, so he stayed aboard the spacecraft. And when I read that in his biography, I googled around, and apparently they never got any good images of it because there is nothing out there on the web of... Uh, of Apollo 15. There, there is a word of that experiment that they tried. You can find information about it, but I don't think they were successful trying to see the Gagan shine from space. Yeah, so if you haven't already, I highly recommend you circle Corey Schmitz on Google+, Plus, uh, follow him on Twitter, and, and keep track of the photos, because everything he produces is just off the charts. The the plan with Corey, he's going to try and bring us uh, star trailing in the middle of a virtual star party somewhere. Oh, that'd be cool. Try, yeah, that'd be very so we'll try cool. and do that. And uh, and this for this trip, I don't know if you talked to him, but he went to Nevada, I think. I did he, briefly. Yeah. yeah, and he did some some observing with uh, with Tanya Sund, who is a uh, she's from South Africa, but was in was in the country, and she's a terrific astrophotographer as well. And so the two of them. I, I always like I always like running those kind of photos on our posts too because it gives it that original not from Wikimedia Commons type post and you know things like the the Gegenschein, I was talking with Corey he thought he had caught it at first too and he's going to try to catch it but it's like you know there are more blurry pictures of guys in ape suits purporting to be Bigfoot on the internet than there are of the if you Google around about the Gegenschein, there are not many good images out there of it. It's uh, it's it's a pretty rare thing to uh, actually image really well. You need really dark skies. That's why. Oh, that's terrific. Okay, well, let's move on. Uh, boy, we got uh, running out of time here. I might have to cut some stuff out here. Uh, so, briefly, let's talk about the. Uh, um, so Elizabeth, you had an interview with Chris Cassidy, and you were talking a bit of. They were talking about Luca Palmertano. So, can you give us a sort of the quick version of this? I can definitely do so. So, as people may remember, about two months ago there was a spacewalk and Parmitano's helmet began filming with water and there was a lot of concern about his safety out there, so they brought him back inside. Chris Cassidy, his crewmate, just came back from Earth about a week ago and finally we journalists had the time to sit down with him and say what really happened out there because there were a lot of accounts. People were saying, you know, it was an emergency. People were saying it wasn't so much of an emergency. He was drowning out there. He wasn't drowning. So, I wanted to get it right from the guy who was standing right next to him. The impression that I got was, yes, he was gravely concerned. One of the things he said was, as a former Navy SEAL, as a former military guy, bad situations can get worse very, very quickly. But he said, I didn't think he was going to drown. He was taking a look very carefully at where the water was heading. It was definitely going around his head. It was definitely in his eyebrows and doing some strange things as it was kind of moving along the hair and weightlessness. But he was watching Parmitano's mouth very closely, and he didn't see the water get anywhere near there. They did have a backup plan. If the water did get into his mouth, they're basically going to vent. They're inside the hatch at this point. They're basically we're just going to open everything up and get him inside quickly. You know, hang the other uh, the other concerns that you might have at that point. But he said, you know what? We never got to that point. 
everything appeared to be fine, and it is. And uh, the other thing that I wanted to bring up to speed on quickly is that the investigation is, of course, ongoing, and they tried to do some tests up there in orbit. They couldn't really see, to what, see what was going on with the, uh, the spacesuit, and their solution is just to bring it back to Earth. So they're waiting for a SpaceX Dragon spacecraft. You know, speaking of those spacecraft I was talking about earlier, when the next one heads up there, they're going to be putting the spacesuit inside of that spacecraft and sending it back down to Earth and getting a better look at it when it gets back home. All right. Uh, well, congratulations on getting that interview. That was, uh, must have been quite fun to talk to him. Oh, he was funny. He's full of the one-liners. I was saying to him, uh, you know, what was it like being up there with Hatfield? And he said, oh, well, I should get credit for some of the videos because he actually was the guy shooting the camera, using the camera behind a lot of the videos. And so I said, all right, well, what's your favorite one? And he said, oh, you know, the David Bowie stuff was kind of fun. And so I thought, that's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. These two astronauts working on a David Bowie music video. And uh, David Bowie himself liked that, uh, that version of Space Oddity. So I thought, that's, that's neat. It's, it's a, an example of technology meeting culture, meeting all sorts of kind of fun things. Yeah, we were mentioning previously that, that that whole run from Chris Hatfield was one of the best examples of how to be an astronaut, how to do your job, but also communicate the wonder and amazingness of this and to kind of let your hair down and, and participate in human culture. It was, it was great. It was a terrific run. So it's great that he got involved in it as well. That's awesome. Uh, okay, so uh, we're going to keep moving. Anyway, you had a great story, great interview with, her, with him, and so just check out uh, Universe Today for that. We've posted a link. We're posting a link to all the, the questions and the comments, all the, all the stories we're covering. Uh, so, Amy, uh, this is great. Now, you didn't sort of initially sort of think this was worthy to throw into the lineup, but this is amazing. Old so news. It's old news. <laughs> well, yeah, but everything you do is everything old news I here. Everything you do is old news. Yeah, even um, the fact that, you know, the universe might be in a black hole, that's like 13.8 billion years is. old, that story. It's like so. the oldest news, really. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so my old news today... Um, I've been doing these sort of short video introductions to, to old articles and stuff just because they're fun and, you know, reaching out to other audiences. And this one got picked up on Boing Boing today, which is kind of awesome, but also, you know, people seem to care that there is this room underneath Launchpad A at Cape Canaveral, and it's still there, and um, it's called the Rubber Room because it is made entirely of rubber. So. The, the short story is that in the event that a Saturn V rocket exploded, it would have been this massive, completely devastating explosion to anybody who was, you know, astronaut, pad crew, anyone. So there were, you know, the slide wires to get them away and the launch board system, but there was also a slide at the base of the mobile launch platform. It was 200 feet long, and it shot anyone who sat down on it. Um, you know, 40 feet below the launch pad into this room. It's got this huge, like, trough at the bottom, like a water slide, um, that's made of rubber so that it wouldn't hurt when you went down it. And then adjacent to this rubber room is a blast chamber, and it's mounted like a missile silo on these massive springs so that if the rocket explodes, you don't move. And this room has 20 chairs and oxygen candles and fire blankets and a toilet. Um, everything you need to stay alive for 24 hours while the air above you clears of anything toxic. Um, and it's still there, and I got to, it's close to the public, but I did get to go in because I know the right people. Um, I got to go in last November, so I, um, I put together a, a little video of that just to kind of quickly introduce that. And you should go watch it because the rubber room was really awesome. <laughs> Unfortunately, cool. I only had my iPhone and it didn't take very good pictures, but there that, are other better pictures out there. <laughs> that that kind of sounds like what NORAD has at Cheyenne Mountain to survive a, a nuclear attack, kind of the same kind of... Oh, really? Yeah. And actually in Ottawa, <laughs> which is where I live, uh, we have a defen bunker, as we call it, and it was an underground bunker that was built in the 50s, I believe it was, to shelter the Prime Minister, which is our or head of the country and all of his staff if there was a problem. So looks like we have these things all over the world. Kind of cool. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Bunkers. <This>, <laughs> I'm trying to get the picture part of your video in my stupid yeah. YouTube. Stupid YouTube. Okay, here. Well, Don't mind me. Uh, every time we queue up something for you, Amy, it messes I up. I know. I just bring problems with me, apparently. Yeah. So I'm going to need you to describe what that... No, you... <laughs> Let me find a, your picture here. Is it, you had you put some pictures. Yeah, here we go. All right. I put them up previously. I don't have any like queued no, up, ready just, to go. It's okay. It's all right. It's all right. I'm gonna pull it from your video here. If I can make stupid YouTube work. Oh, cool. Oh. That's, yeah. Okay. That's what it looks like now. It um there is a video. I forget what is. I think Burke, Jason, or James Burke. He did a video for the BBC in the '60s, looking at sort of everything about um, Apollo going to the moon. And one of the things he did, he actually went through the whole procedure of going down the slide and and 
in that video, it looks, you know, better. <laughs> <laughs> that makes me wonder if, it's, if it would even have been feasible to to go through all of those steps in the instance of an exploding Saturn V. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> It's got to have been one of those things like, okay, well, we see that this tank is ruptured and that it's about to go, so you yeah. have 40 seconds, get down there. Hmm. Yeah. All right. That is awesome. That is really cool. Okay. Uh, I think... Stop talking. Okay. Uh, okay, so the last piece of information is that the, and I and I will mangle the pronunciation, so we're all going to take a crack at it. Is it GOCE? G-O-C-E. I'm going to say G-O-C-E because it just takes it just as long to say. Yeah. G-O-C-E <laughs> spacecraft is coming back yeah, to Earth the bad way. The European Space Agency's Gravity, Ocean, and Circulation Explorer is going to be re-entering uh, after having a pretty good run. I mean, it was a pretty successful mission uh, mapping out the 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 geospatial uh, gravity field of the Earth and just monitoring the ocean circulation. It's in low Earth orbit, weighs about a ton. It's running out of fuel. It's probably going to have an uncommanded uh, re-entry here in late 2009. I don't think we've had a big one since it was URs. Yeah, yep. yeah and it, it's got yeah. kind of a, a kind of cool Battlestar Galactica look to it there, too. So it, it's... Uh, uh, URs was a big reentry last year. Phobos Grunt was a very high profile, and Phobos Grunt had a uh, very toxic, dangerous hydrazine on board too. So that was kind of uh, kind of scary when that. And it wasn't supposed to come back to Earth. It was supposed to go to Mars, so it never did. Uh, that aerodynamic shape did it have something to do with the fact that it was low in orbit? I don't think so. I, I, I'm not certain. I haven't really followed this mission that much, but I don't. I, I don't know where they. It, maybe they just thought it was cool. But it's kind of a, a cool. Well, it looks to, like the shape that it was designed to fit inside a launch fairing, right? That could be. It might have been yeah. just the parameters of what they had to launch it in. It's got a xenon-powered engine, I believe, and that's what the the fuel that's going to be running out on it. Uh, it's re-entering late late 2000. I haven't heard a, a precise date. I track a lot of the re-entries up on Space Track and on Aerospace. Uh, industry has a website where they track them. I haven't seen it come up on the list yet, so it's not it's not re-entering soon, soon, but somewhere by the end of 2013. It's, it's not like up within a week. I haven't seen what the orbital parameters is as far as what kind of inclination they put it up in, so that would tell you where it, it may re-enter. But, uh, we had a fun but death watch for the URs spacecraft. So Re-entries re are actually kind of fun to track. Kind and of re Reentries pick up as we're going towards solar max too, as the at the Earth's atmosphere kind of puffs out a little bit. You usually you see an, a spike in reentries. However, this solar max has been kind of a non-max, so it's uh, usually we would see a spike in reentries right about now. Judging but, how URs end up ended up coming back, uh, yeah, I mean they can be quite dramatic, especially if you yeah. follow online, because you have all of these stations that are picking up the the rapidly deorbiting. Uh, piece of spacecraft, and then when they don't pick up on one, then they have to assume, okay, well, it's you know, I, it's landed or it, it impacted I, between here and here. I saw URs on one of its very last passes, like it was like two or three orbits before it finally re-entered. And, and when they're when they're about to re-enter, they are trucking. Have you ever watched the ISS come over? It's moving about twice to three times as fast. Hmm. It's uh, it's kind of cool to see them on their final orbits, and I've seen satellites tumble before too, and that's kind of neat to see because you actually see them kind of. We usually say satellites don't flash, but in the in the in the sense, if they're rolling end over end before they re-enter, that's what they'll do is they'll kind of go bright, faint, bright, faint as they're coming over in the sky. So it's kind of nifty to see. Awesome. Well, that was a lot of stories. I thanks for keeping pace with uh, with this week, everyone. Uh, so let's go through and we'll uh, we'll wrap this up. Uh, and give people a chance to uh, explain things they're working on. So, Amy Share Title, where do we find out more? Um, more at my website, amysharetitle.com. My blog, Vintage Space, is there. I'm also at Discovery News, Al Jazeera English, Scientific American, Device, Motherboard, uh, some more. Twitter, boing, boing. AST. Yes, when, when they like me. <laughs> um, Twitter, AST, Vintage Space, Google+, and Facebook. So, yeah. Awesome. All right. David Dickinson, a.k.a. The Astro Guys. Let's see. I was active this week on my own site, Astro Guys with a Z, Universe Today, Listosaur, Canada.com, and I am working up uh, probably my next thing is a big how to observe ISIN over October and November toward Perigillion for Universe, Universe Today. Today. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> All right. Unless somebody scoops me, which I don't think. Uh, Bob's already written his, so he's usually yeah. the only one that does observation stuff. So we kind of tag team those. Elizabeth, where can we find out more? 
He did a great um, job, okay. by the way. Thanks. Thank you very much for joining us this week. Well, thank you. I really enjoyed this. I'm going to do it more regularly. Hey, um, invitation's the, open. So where do we find out more? Excellent. All right. Well, uh, my social networks are a great place to get kind of a clearinghouse for everything that I do. So Howl Space as well as my Google Plus account. And uh, in addition to that, you can find me on various websites, including Universe Today, Space.com, Space Exploration Network. Um, I'm on the magazine All About Space. And uh, yeah, just basically whoever wants to give me a call and give me some work. It did. Great, great, uh, it did. great, great bit on the na nature of things there a few months ago. I actually watched oh, thank that online. You. That was very cool. Yeah, yeah there was a, a time when uh, a Canadian television show called The Nature of Things got in touch with me and said, uh, we're doing a special on Chris Hadfield and just how great of a job he's doing as a social media persona up in orbit. So would you mind doing some commentary? And I, I always laugh because it was six astronauts, a doctor, his son, and me. So I always kind of call myself kind of the peanut gallery because I'm not really the expert there. I'm just throwing in these observations about things I've heard when I've been talking to him in orbit. So, but did you fun. grow up on the nature of things like I did, and Amy probably oh, did totally. too? Yeah, I, I grew up. I, I grew up in northern Maine, so we used to get Canadian television. Oh, really? When I was a kid, so I, I read. When, when I got the Sorry, David. When I got the oh, email in my inbox, I just was looking and I was going, "Is this a hoax? Is this the real nature of things?" And anyway, I replied and. It was. It was the actual nature of things. They said, okay, let's do an interview with you. And it was the most surreal thing. But, you know, in all seriousness, they are an amazing documentary crew. I spent almost the entire day, actually, with three or four people that really know their camera work, really know how to make an apartment look good, really know their techniques. And uh, it was inspiring because I really learned a lot about documentary production from them. Some of them have been all over the world, including astronomical observatories, actually. We had a big discussion about every single one this guy had, had been to. So uh, I had a lot of fun with that particular project. Uh, Jason Major, more of Jason Major. Uh, I am at uh, lightsinthedark.com. I'm also on Twitter over at JP Major. And uh, you can find my writing on Universe Today and Discovery News Space. Terrific. Uh, great. And so if you haven't already, subscribe wherever you're seeing this. There should be a subscribe button on YouTube over the year over there. Uh, we, we, I start up the Weekly Space Hangout. We do that on Google+, Plus, but I've actually been starting it up on Universe Today as well. So if you happen to f sort of come by Universe Today around noon Pacific, 3 Eastern, then we'll start the Weekly Space Hangout here as well. Uh, great. Well, thanks everyone for watching. Thanks everyone for joining us. Really appreciate it. And we'll see you all next week.